All right, so this is going to be the week one of the pharmacy, the pharmacy technician course. This is going to be an eight-week course with one PowerPoint for each week. Throughout the PowerPoints, we will discuss pharmacy law, pharmacy math, the procedures of being a pharmacy technician, the different tools that are used as a pharmacy technician, and many more. Week one. Some of these PowerPoint slides reference Arizona laws because that's where these videos are made. However, many of these is going to be the same throughout the United States. The reason why pharmacy technician license have been given to people is because in 2004, the Arizona State Board of Pharmacy implemented new rules for the pharmacy technician licensure. The true reason for such change is due to greater patient safety. Pharmacy technicians have always been liable for their actions, but the purpose of the technician licensure is to give the state board more oversight of pharmacy personnel, the direct result being an increase in patient safety. The pharmacy technician license is so that there are better trained pharmacy technicians instead of people who are just pulled off the street to do the work. There is now training that needs to be required in order to become a pharmacy technician. This slide is just about this pharmacy technician program and what it covers. It will provide training on topics such as how pharmacies work, what laws govern pharmacy, how drugs are dispensed, what dosage forms are common, how each drug fits into its respective class, and how to calculate everything from concentration to percentage discounts. It will also give you tips and hints for the pharmacy technician exam, increasing both your test knowledge and chances for certification. If you study everything in this test, if you study everything in this PowerPoint and you have a good understanding of it, you are guaranteed the pass to the PTCB. We recommend that you sign up for the test immediately after the last class because we want this information to remain fresh and we don't want you to forget any of this. There are practice tests that are available. In order to pass the class, you will need to score an average of 80% on the quizzes and an 85% on the final. To sign up for the pharmacy technician test, you need to go to www.ptcb.org and follow the instructions for signing up. It is now also a requirement in Arizona for fingerprinting. To get a fingerprinting packet, please call the Arizona Board of Pharmacy at 602-771-2727. The first thing that we'll talk about today is the parts of a prescription. The first part that we'll talk about today is going to be the patient information. On each prescription, the following information needs to be provided, the full name of the patient, the address of the patient, and the date of birth. These are to help confusion just in case there are juniors and seniors in the home with the date of birth. And if there's a John Smith, you don't have a thousand different options, but you have the one address and the date of birth that will narrow the options down. The next part that we'll talk about briefly is going to be the SIG codes. So the SIG codes are also known as the Cigna. Don't confuse this with the prescriber signature because it has the same prefix. The SIG codes may include the following. The number of the dosage units per dose. For example, take one tablet, give one teaspoon. It also includes the route of administration, frequency of dosing, duration of dosing, the purpose of the prescription, any special instructions, and also warning. The prescriber signature is required to make the prescription a legal document. Every prescription needs to be signed by the doctor or the prescriber. Usually the prescriber will indicate his or her degree if it's not already pre-printed on, on the, the blank RX. RX. The prescription will usually indicate on the face of the prescription in some way whether the brand is to be dispensed or if generic substitution is permissible. This is noted by seeing a DNS, which stands for do not substitute, a DAW for dispensed as written, or also a brand medically necessary. So if you see any of those on any of the prescriptions, you know that you need to fill it exactly how the doctor writes it for. The date the prescription is written is also important because all prescriptions expire after one year from the date written. That's gonna be an important to know, and we'll kind of go over that more later. The controlled substances prescriptions require or expire after six months from the date the writ from the prescription was written. So if the prescription was written, on February 4th of 2015, for a controlled prescription, it'll expire on 
August 4th, 2015. For a regular prescription or a, a non-controlled medication, it's going to be on February 4th of 2016. It's also important to remember that C2 prescriptions or Control 2 medications are not allowed to have refills. The C3 through C5 may be refilled up to five times. Prescriber information also needs to be on the prescription in case we need to contact the doctor's office. The prescriber's information includes the prescriber's name, the address, the phone number, and also a DEA number or an NPI number if the prescription is written for a controlled substance. Here are a few common SIG codes that are going to be important to know. We will talk more about these in the future week. But if you want to get a head start on that material, here are a few. You can find the SIG codes here, here, and here. Whenever you see PRN, that stands for as needed. If it's ever written for A, that stands for before. AC is before mills, and so on. This is going to be the frequency of the medication. These are going to be the units of the medication. You have a G, which is grams, GR, which is grain, GTT, which is drops, and so on and so forth. There are many, many, many more SIG codes to know, but these are the most common ones that I have seen. This is going to be the route that the prescription is to be used. So as you can see, D stands for right, ID stands for intradermal, IM stands for intramuscular, and so on and so forth. Here's additional SIG codes that might be used. The dosage forms and definitions. It is important to know the different dosage forms that a medication can come in. An aerosol is a system consisting of a suspension of fine solid or liquid particles in air or gas. The SOMS is a resinous substance containing benzoic or cinnamic acids or their esters. Capsules is a solid dosage form in which the drug is enclosed in either a hard or soft soluble container or shell of a suitable form of gelatin. These will be important to know, so I would advise you to memorize what the form is and what their definitions are. The next group is going to be a cream which is a semi-solid or thick liquid emulsion containing medicine dissolved or suspended in the emulsion and intended for external application. Elixirs are clear sweetened hydroalcoholic liquids intended for oral use. An emulsion is a dispersed system in which one liquid, termed the dispersed or internal phase, is distributed in small globules throughout the body of the second liquid termed the dispersion medium or external phase. Lotions is a liquid preparations intended for external application to the skin. Ointment is a semi-solid preparation usually containing medicinal substance and intended for external application to the body. Ointments are not water soluble. Now I'm going to take a break here and let you know that a common method that I see people use to study these are flashcards. So making flashcards of these might be good and if you need to you can just rewind the video and go back and take a look. Another dosage form is parenteral, a product that is injected directly into a fluid system of the body, whether it's going to be the blood, lymph, intra, or extracellular liquids. The term parenteral means to introduce this substance into the body via means other than the GI tract. We'll also talk about this in week three. The way that I remember parenteral is the root word that it looks like is parent. Parenteral is going to be your injections. Kids don't like to inject themselves because it hurts. So that's why a parent would inject. So you know that a parenteral form is going to be an injection. The different types of injection will be intravenous, which is direct, injected directly into a vein, intramuscular, which is injected into the skeletal muscle, usually a deltoid or a gluteal regions, subcutaneous is injected into the tissue directly below the skin, intradermal is injected into the skin layer, and intraspinal is injected into the spinal column. More dosage forms is going to be pastes. Ointments like preparations for external application characterized by the presence of large amounts of powder. A solution is a one-phase system of two or more substances combined yielding total dissolution. Ophthalmic solution is a sterile solution free from foreign particles and suitably compounded and dispensed for the installation into the eye. Preparations of an ophthalmic solution involves careful consideration of factors such as the inherent toxicity of the drug itself, osmotic pressure, the need for buffering agents, the need for pres preservatives, sterilization, and proper packaging. 
Now, why do you think that you're going to want a sterile solution? Why is it important for the ophthalmic solutions to be sterile? Because if it's not, then you're going to put unwanted compounds or unwanted molecules into your eye, which could cause an infection. Spirits are alcoholic or hydroalcoholic solutions of volatile or aromatic substances. Suppositories is going to be a solid medication for insertions into body cavities. Generally going to be the rectal, vaginal, or urethral. Syrups is a liquid preparation in concentrated aqueous solutions containing sugar, usually sucrose. Tablets is a solid pharmaceutical dosage forms prepared by compressing and molding. A tincture is an alcoholic or hydroalcoholic solutions prepared from, the, from vegetables or chemical substances. Transdermal. Transdermal drug delivery is designed to be placed on the skin to give the controlled release of a drug. Usually transdermal systems are in the form of a patch. There are other dosage forms, but these are the ones that I find to be the most relevant and the most important that are included on the exam. Something that's going to be important is also knowing Roman numerals. Roman numerals are also a fading fashion, but some doctors like to use it because it's harder to change and make sense for fraudulent prescriptions. I also think it's because the doctors can do whatever they want and they want to show that they can do Roman numerals. So here, an I equals one, V equals 5, X equals 10, L equals 50, C equals 100, D equals 500, and M equals 1000. When letters are repeated, its value is repeated. So I, I, I equals 1 plus 1 plus 1, so which, which is 3. Or X, X equals 10 plus 10, which is 20. A letter value may not be repeated more than three times. V, 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 v is not equal to 20, and x, 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 x is not equal to 60. V, D, and L are never repeated. V, V does not equal 10, and D, D does not equal 100. If you have a V, V, theoretically it would be 10, but there's an easier way to write, write 10, which is just x, and there's an easier way to write 100, and that's c. So we always want to go the easier route when, with the Roman numerals. When a smaller numeral value is put before a greater numeral value, we subtract the smaller from the larger. For example, we have the smaller put before the greater, so 1 minus 10 equals 9, because we know that 1 is i is 1, x is 10, and because it's before that 1, it equals 9. For this, we have 1 minus 5 equals 4. For this one, we have... 100, and what is D? Do you remember what D is without going back? D is 500. So 100 minus 500 equals 400. XC, you have 10 minus 100, and that equals 90. When a smaller numeral value is placed after a greater numeral value, we add the smaller to the greater number. So it's just the opposite. So we have X plus I is... 10 plus 1 equals 11. V plus I is going to be 5 plus 1 equals 6. LXX is going to be 50 plus 10 plus 10. That equals 70. MD is, what is M? Do you remember what M is? It's 1,000. So 1,000 plus 500 equals 1500. V, D, and L are never subtracted from greater numbers. L, M is not equal to 950 and V, M is not equal to 995. Although this is, this does look simpler, we have to remember this rule that V, D, and L are never subtracted from greater numbers. Never subtract more than one numeral value from a greater numeral value at a time. I, 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 X is not equal to 7 and XXC is not equal to 80. Use I before V and X only, the next two highest numerals. This is also true for X and C. Use X before L and C only. Use X before D and M only. For example, IV equals 4 and IX equals 9, but IC does not equal 99. XC equals 90, but XM is not equal to 990. Let's practice. So 30 is XXX, and you can continue to go through here and find these. Conversions. Whenever we are here kilo, it's going to be a thousand. Centi is one one hundredth. Milli is one one thousandth. 
micro is one one millionth. Whenever we're talking about weight, it's always going to be grams. Whenever we talk about volume, the general unit is going to be liter. Length is meter, but we're not going to use meters in the pharmacy world, so we can just ignore that one. The conversions of units are going to be important to know also. It's going to be important to know that 20 grains equals one scruple, 8 drams is 1 ounce, 1 ounce is 480 grains, 3 scruples is 1 dram, or 60 grains, 12 ounces equals 1 pound, or 5,760 grains. One ounce equals 437.5 grains, which is also 28.4 grams. 16 ounces equals one pound, which also equals 7,000 grains. Here are some more conversions that you're gonna to need to know. There are a few of these that, depending on who you ask, have a different amount but I would advise you to memorize the ones that we have here. Here's also more to memorize. Now we're gonna talk about conversions. We'll talk about it more in detail later. You may have your own way of doing things, and there's gonna be multiple ways to do these, but I'll show you the way that I like to do because it's consistent with the rest of the course. The first question reads, if there are 2.5 milligrams per tablet, how many milligrams would there be in 90 tablets? So, the way that I like to set this up is line equals line. If you can remember that for many problems, it'll help so much. So, line equals line. On the left side, I put my known. So, the known value. And you get the known value from the question itself. On the right side is going to be your unknown. The next thing you do is you want to figure out the units that you're dealing with in the problem. So we have milligrams and tablets. Next we'll want to label the units. So on the left you're going to want milligrams on the top and whatever's on the top on the left side also needs to be the top on the right side. So our known value is the 2.5 milligrams per one tablet. So we know that the other unit that we're going to use is tablet. So there's 2.5 milligrams in one tablet, and our unknown is going to give us one known, but the other one is going to be unknown. So which one's going to be our unknown? The key word here is how many milligrams. So that's going to be X milligrams and our known is going to be 90 tablets. Now what we do is we cross multiply 2.5 times 90 divided by the 1 and that'll give us the x value. So 2.5 times 90 equals 225 divided by the 1. That means in 90 tablets there's 225 milligrams. If you'd like more practice with the conversions, there should be more in the book. Or you can find many online with pharmacy technician unit conversion. conversions. The, next, the last thing that we'll talk about today is going to be temperature conversions. There are three different formulas that I will show you. The first one will be used if you are good at algebra. That formula is going to be degrees Celsius equals parentheses degree Fahrenheit minus 32 in parentheses times 5 over 9. So for example if you have 10 degrees Fahrenheit and you want to convert that to degrees Celsius you just plug in the values and solve for the other value. So degrees Celsius equals 10 degrees Fahrenheit minus 32 times 5 over 9 equals, go ahead and pause the video and try to figure this out for yourself. Alright, I hope you had time to figure it out. This is going to be, when you subtract those two, you're going to have negative 22 times the 5 over 9, and that gives you the degree Celsius, which C, the degree Celsius, equals negative 12.2. The next formula you can use is if you're good at memorizing degrees Fahrenheit equals 1.8 degrees 
Celsius plus 32. And this is actually going to be multiplied. So you're going to take the degree Celsius multiplied by 1.8 plus the 32. So if you have 30 degrees Celsius, go ahead and pause the video and go ahead and convert that to degrees Fahrenheit. You should have gotten the answer 86 degrees. The next formula you can use is degrees Celsius equals the degrees Fahrenheit minus 32 all over 1.8. So if we have 100 degrees Fahrenheit, what is that going to be in Celsius? Go ahead and pause the video and try to do it yourself. All right, so the answer should be 37.8. You can go ahead and continue practicing this with many different numbers. All right, that's the end of PowerPoint week one. If you have any questions, feel free to email me at farmvilletech at gmail.com. Thank you, and good luck studying. Goodbye.